Today's episode examines a case involving domestic violence and may be disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. In the fall of 1986, 39-year-old Danish flight attendant and mother of three, Hella Crafts, mysteriously vanished from Newtown, Connecticut. As the case transformed from that of a missing person to a brutal and grisly murder, a media frenzy ensued with headlines coast-to-coast emblazoned with the gruesome and disturbing details. Following the arrest of Hella's husband, airline pilot Richard Crafts, it would become known as the Woodchipper Murder, inspiring a critically acclaimed film and being the subject of the debut episode of Forensic Files. While the media poured out article after article, there was an eerily similar story developing that was falling through the cracks. 35-year-old Regina Brown mysteriously disappeared just four months after Hella in March of 1987. Living less than three miles from the craft's home, Regina was also a flight attendant and mother of three, married to a pilot. Last seen at New York's LaGuardia Airport, Regina Brown vanished on March 26th. As investigators worked to unravel the case, they'd uncover a brutal history of domestic violence, death threats, and bizarre accusations from her estranged husband. In the days leading up to her disappearance, Regina had put into motion a clandestine plan to escape sending her children to her family in Texas where she planned to follow. But Regina never made it to Texas. She never saw her children again. It seemed clear, in Regina's final desperate hours, someone had gotten to her before she could get away. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 165, The Vanishing of Regina Brown, Part 1. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. In today's episode, we examine a truly bizarre and disturbing disappearance that has never received the attention it deserves. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com. Regina Brown was a bright, witty, talented woman and mother. Over a period of five years, she watched as her life was transformed into a nightmare. Through court documents and eyewitness accounts, and even Regina's own words, we'll examine the circumstances surrounding her mysterious disappearance. This is episode 165 The Vanishing of Regina Brown, Part 1. Regina Bernadine Fontenot was born on Tuesday, December 4, 1951, to parents Emil and Ernestine in Liberty County, Texas. Regina was the Fontenot's third child, having an older brother and a sister at the time. She'd later be one of five siblings, with another brother and sister born over the next seven years. Regina would be raised at the family home in the small city of Ames, 50 miles northeast of Houston and 60 miles west of the Louisiana border, where her father had been born. Ames held a population of less than a thousand residents, and even today, it has barely eclipsed that number. Regina grew up in a very religious home. Her parents were devout Roman Catholics. Church and faith were important to her from an early age and throughout much of her life. Regina would attend Catholic school during her younger years, as would her siblings. As a child, Regina was described as adventurous, enjoying being outside, playing sports, getting her hands dirty and her knees scraped. Small in stature but chock full of energy, she spent countless hours running beneath the hot Texas sun with her siblings and friends. As she entered her teen years, 
Regina transitioned to nearby Liberty High School, just a few miles northwest of her home, where her varied interests took her in different directions. She was drawn towards nursing early on, but that would change as the years passed. During her senior year, Regina was noted as belonging to the Pep Squad, Band, Thespian Club, Future Homemakers of America, and Future Nurses of America. However, by this time, she found her interests keenly fixed on fashion. Regina was described as a stunning petite beauty standing 5 feet 4 inches tall, but moving with all the confidence and sophistication of a runway model. She dressed herself with a noticeable sense of style, and often in garments she'd crafted herself. One characteristic that is often mentioned is her voice, described by many as dulcet, soft, melodic, and soothing to the ear. By the time she graduated in the summer of 1969, the 18-year-old decided that she was going to pursue a career in the fashion industry. She set off for Dallas, matriculating at Texas Women's University, where she majored in clothing and fashion merchandising. Fashion was her primary focus, and throughout much of her college years, Regina appeared in local newspapers, such as the Liberty Vindicator and the Denton Daily Lasso, as a model. She'd appear dressed in clothing created by upperclassmen and local businesses, taking part in several shows hosted by Neiman Marcus. Each year, she entered the annual show of Campus Originals, a fashion show sponsored by local businesses which saw students creating and modeling their own designs. Regina always made the short list, accruing awards as a runner-up in her first few years. In the spring of 72, when she was 20, she won an award for her own design, described by the lasso as a two-piece jumpsuit of dusty pink suede and denim. The following year, she'd graduate, earning a bachelor's degree in fashion merchandising. After college, Regina moved into working for a clothing store, with her intentions still seemingly targeting a career in fashion, but life would take her in a different direction. After her foray into fashion, she moved on, taking a position at a local bank, but this did not appear to be the future she imagined either. Then, in February of 1977, at the age of 26, Regina stepped into a field that she'd stick with for the rest of her life, signing on to become a flight attendant for American Airlines. She enjoyed the variety the job offered her, with travel taking her all around the country, and her polite and caring demeanor suited that position enhanced by her charming and pleasant voice. By the late 1970s, the culture was shifting and the era of the stewardess had passed. American Airlines had bid farewell to their over-sexualized uniforms of the 1960s, tight, short red dresses dubbed American Beauty, making way for longer, muted navy blue dresses and jumpers, or for the first time, a pantsuit option. Each would be accented by a scarf checked with red, white, and blue diamonds as the slow evolution to the modern uniform began. Regina loved her job, and she loved the new style, something befitting of a professional woman on the go. Outside of introducing Regina to new places as she traveled from coast to coast, it would be walking the aisles of the airplane high above the clouds where she'd eventually capture the eye of Willis Nicholas Brown Jr., Seventeen years her senior, Brown had flown in the Air Force during the Vietnam War and after his service had pursued a career as an electrical engineer before joining American as a co-pilot. The relationship between Regina and Brown was a slow burn at first. She was just in her late 20s while he was in his early 40s. When they first met, Brown was married, living with his wife and four daughters in East Setauket, New York, on the north shore of Long Island. Brown was noted as being polite, kind, and extremely charming. He made friends easily, and dressed in his slick uniform, he didn't struggle to catch the attention of women. In a profile on Brown, the Hartford Courant would write that he was, quote, tall, handsome, possessing a military bearing, and a diplomat's manners, end quote. He made a good impression, and seemingly with Regina, a lasting one. Over the next few years, they got to know one another, and following Brown's divorce in 1981, the two were open to pursue something more intimate. According to friends of each at the time, Brown wasted no time in sweeping Regina off her feet. The relationship was, by all accounts, a happy one, for a time. 
but there was a darkness lurking beneath the surface that Regina hadn't yet caught a glimpse of. Sometime during the early 1980s, Regina found herself turning her attention back to religion, from which she had slightly lapsed, and she went on to become a born-again Christian. Brown had been raised Baptist, though there didn't appear to be any conflict as the two transformed a whirlwind romance into a relationship. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, on Friday, June 25, 1982, Regina and Brown were married in Connecticut. At the time, Regina was 30 and Willis was 47. Regina moved into Brown's home in Newtown, located on a cul-de-sac on Whipperwill Hill Road. The news came as somewhat of a surprise to Regina's parents, who wouldn't meet their new son-in-law until six days later, on July 1st. At the time, they were charmed by Brown, as many people had been before, and there was no denying that Regina was very much in love with her new husband. The speed with which the couple married has been pointed out in numerous articles over the years, his divorce having finalized only the previous year, but there may have been another reason for the quick turn of events. Six months after they were married, in December of 1982, Regina gave birth to their first child, Willis Nicholas Brown III. While this was a time of joy and celebration, it would be short-lived as everything was about to change. Three months after the birth of their first child in March of 1983, Brown told Regina that he wanted a divorce. This was a problem for the young mother who, in part due to her religious beliefs, didn't see divorce as an option. According to court documents obtained by the Hartford Courant, Brown's reason for wanting a divorce was unexpected, to say the least. Brown accused his wife of being unfaithful, alleging that their son had been fathered not by him, but instead by his close friend Chuck Rich. While no specific reasoning has ever been given for this sudden belief that Regina cheated, Brown later testified that he had witnessed Rich twirling Regina's hair in the car, and his wife seemed uncomfortable around the man, which made Brown think it was a sign of guilt. A blood test was given in order to satisfy Brown's suspicions, but even when the test results confirm beyond a 99% certainty that he was the father, this did little to change his mind. According to the Quran, he would go on to claim that Regina must have bribed the secretary at the clinic to lie about the results. There would be two additional blood tests yielding the same results. This did not appear to be a new behavior for Brown, who, according to his 1981 divorce decree, had also denied paternity with his first wife, alleging that his children were the result of infidelity. Disturbingly, Court documents from this divorce are flush with allegations of domestic violence, with Brown having been accused of both first striking his wife and, according to the Quran, attempting to strangle her on at least one occasion. Brown testified that he had left the home he shared with his first wife in 1973 and had returned on occasion when he needed something. Among those demands was apparently sex. As Brown himself testified, quote, I do recall we went through a time wherein I was forcing myself sexually on my wife. End quote. If that sentence really makes you angry, especially since it was on the record in a courtroom, you're definitely not alone. Sadly, it seems rather safe to assume that Regina was not aware of the details regarding Brown's first marriage. Most of what she'd know about it would have likely come from him. In hopes of saving the marriage, Regina suggested that they attend counseling together. Picking a name at random from the phone book, the two went to their first meeting one month later in April, but Brown wasn't happy about this situation either. After a few sessions, he stopped attending while Regina kept going on her own. This led Brown to believe that Regina was having an affair with the counselor, and in order to catch them in the act, he allegedly bugged their home phone on at least two occasions. Four months later in August, Brown filed for divorce for the first time. According to his testimony, just days later, he says he found the counselor in the new town home, quote, rapidly putting his clothes on. Brown went on to note that at the time, Regina was not wearing makeup, which was out of character for her. Regina, however, denied ever having an affair with her counselor or anyone else. Brown claimed that around this time, he told Regina to move out and go back to Texas when she told him she was pregnant again. 
Brown stated that Regina requested to continue living in their new town home until the child was born, and he agreed. For the next few months, things seemed to somewhat calm down, but by the end of the year, things would take a violent turn. In December, when Regina was seven months pregnant, an argument spun out of control and resulted in Brown punching her. Later, when testifying under oath, Brown didn't deny this assault. Instead, he accused Regina of baiting him into it by bringing up the counselor, who he alleged was the father of their second child. Their daughter, Raina, was born two months later, in February of 1984, and Brown apparently remembered the deal they'd made. According to the Quran, Brown arrived at the hospital to pick up his wife and new daughter with Regina's packed luggage in the back seat. He was planning to drive them to the airport, where he expected Regina to fly home to Texas for good, but Regina refused to get in the car. Brown apparently drove off after several minutes of arguing, and it wouldn't be until several hours later that one of Brown's daughters showed up and gave the new mother a ride home to Newtown. That same night, after getting home, Regina placed a call to a domestic abuse hotline, but Brown grabbed the phone and began yelling at the volunteer on the other end. He accused Regina of being unfaithful yet again, saying this second child was not his either, and he added in an accusation that Regina had given him herpes. For the record, two blood tests were eventually conducted, both showing that Brown was Raina's father. When asked about this in court, Brown brushed it off saying that when he argues, he just says whatever. Two months later, on Tuesday, April 10th, 1984, the Newtown Police Department responded to a 911 call at the Whipperwill Hill Road house. Regina told police that Brown had become physically violent and attempted to choke her during an argument. Police arrested Brown and charged him with third-degree assault, though charges were dropped under an agreement that Brown would seek counseling with a mental health professional. According to the Quran, Brown attended only one session and left before it was over. He'd later testify that he felt the psychiatrist had prejudged him, and he was apparently told that he was on the verge of committing a violent act. Discussing the assault against Regina, Brown later accused her of manipulating the situation so that he would be arrested, saying, quote, I'm sure she had planned this entire scenario, end quote. During these first years of marriage, Regina confided much in her best friend, Hope Lambert, who worked as a flight attendant for U.S. Air. Lambert later stated that she became aware of how tense the situation was during a friendly trip to New York. According to Lambert, as a group of friends and their children were hanging out, Regina became extremely upset and said she needed to get home before dark. Hope, taken aback by this, brought Regina to her house where it suddenly began snowing and Regina couldn't get her car started. At the time, Lambert told Regina she could stay with her, but that didn't help the situation, as Lambert told the Quran, quote, She started to cry and said, Oh my God, Willis will kill me. End quote. According to Lambert, Regina said that if she stayed over, Willis would assume she was having an affair. Lambert went on to say that she and Regina often prayed together, and while she prayed for silly things like the power to resist urges to go shopping, Regina always prayed for her husband to stop beating her. Over the course of the next two years, the situation did not improve, though Brown living elsewhere did allow Regina to have some semblance of a life, with friends saying that she was always looking over her shoulder regardless. Apparently, Brown did return to the new town home at different times during these two years, but he allegedly provided no financial support to Regina. Working as a flight attendant, she brought home approximately $25,000 a year. Brown, however, was pulling in close to $100,000 a year from his salary as a co-pilot, and he added to that through his own moped rental business called Moped Man. Brown had opened the business on Rhode Island's Block Island, which sits approximately 9 miles south off the mainland and is 14 miles off the eastern end of Long Island. According to the Courant, Court documents show that between December of 1984 and July of 1985, Regina was essentially on her own, struggling to provide for the children. Hope Lambert would later state that she could recall the children wearing hand-me-down clothing and celebrating Christmas with one gift apiece beneath a tree decorated only with cotton balls. 
Sometime during 1984, Regina became pregnant with the couple's third and last child, who would be born in August of 1985. As you might have guessed, Brown again denied paternity, though this time only one blood test was conducted and, as all the others had shown, he was the father. Around this time, Regina began seeking assistance through friends and co-workers at American Airlines, wanting to get Brown psychiatric help. Reportedly, Brown heard the rumors as they both worked for the same company, and in response, he penned a letter referred to in court documents as his book, the goal of which was to reveal the real Regina Brown. The letter, which was directed to friends, family, and American Airlines, was 21 pages in length and was supposed to convey their marital problems from Brown's point of view. According to him, whenever he tried to talk to someone about the marriage, they just assumed he was crazy, having heard Regina's account first. The letter he wrote reads in part, quote, Regina is a pathological liar with a criminal mentality who has the blessings of a pretty face, a soft voice, and an innate ability to much too easily sway people into following her flute. But in your case, do not allow her to cover your logic with a tapestry of woven tales. Simply ask her some rather pointed questions and then listen, really listen, to her answers. Instead of sweet soothings, you will hear a cacophony of confusing sounds, both dissonant and disjointed, as contradictory as a lie will become. End quote. Brown accused Regina of being unfaithful, abusing drugs and alcohol, and of having mental health problems for which he argued she needed proper care. Hope Lambert later told the Courant that she'd heard these rumors and paid extra close attention to Regina, but she never saw anything to verify them. Lambert stated that Regina admitted to trying cocaine on one occasion only, and that she never saw Regina take an alcoholic drink. She never saw Regina seeming out of it, drunk or drowsy. She'd never even seen her lose her temper. Something was definitely wrong, though, as she later stated, quote, I'd noticed other things, cowering things, end quote. During this time, friends and family reported that Regina was living under constant fear and was struggling with the remarkably difficult circumstances of her marriage. In 1986, Easter fell on Sunday, March 30th, and it was the first year of a new tradition for Regina and her friends. Hope Lambert had decided that the group of friends should divide up the holidays, with each hosting a party at their home so no one person felt overwhelmed. Regina ended up receiving Easter as her holiday, and it would become a big affair, organizing Easter egg hunts, cooking a large meal, and decorating. Brown would be present at the Easter party. However, he allegedly refused to eat anything Regina had prepared, arguing that she was likely to poison him. In order to satisfy this paranoia, Regina agreed that both would prepare their own spaghetti dinners and offer them up at the party. The couple passed it off as a competition, as though they were attempting to see who was the better cook. Due to the busyness of the holiday, running around with children, hunting eggs, and chatting with friends, no one seemed to notice the tension simmering beneath the surface. It would be through this party that Regina would meet and befriend her neighbor, 38-year-old Linda Van Horn. Van Horn became close with the young mother of three and, living just down the road, would often provide daycare for the kids while Regina was at work. The two often spent time together talking, and Van Horn became, in a sense, a confidant and a pillar of support for Regina, who continues to this day to advocate for her friend. In September of 1986, Regina found herself testifying before a judge as she sought to obtain a restraining order against Brown. Much of the testimony revolves around former encounters with Brown where he had become physically violent. According to Regina's testimony, one of the most dangerous and frightening incidents occurred on Tuesday, July 1st, 1986. Regina testified that Brown became extremely agitated and violent that day after an encounter with the children's babysitter. Reportedly, the babysitter had given one of the children a kiss on the lips, and Brown became livid, referring to the behavior as sexual abuse. This kicked off an argument between the couple, which escalated to Brown choking Regina until she lost consciousness. In her affidavit for the restraining order, Regina stated, quote, While he was strangling me, he said, This is it, Regina. You are dead. When I awoke, he had a rope and said he was going to hang himself. 
He added, I might as well kill us all. End quote. Brown disagreed, arguing that this alleged assault had never taken place and that Regina was making things up to try and sway the court in her favor. However, this was not the only incident Regina would testify about. She noted that while Brown did not live in the home any longer, he would still drop by and this often resulted in violence and threats. In her testimony, Regina stated that on Wednesday, September 3rd, Brown arrived at the new town home and threatened her. According to her statement, Brown said, quote, if you are not out of this house when I get back, you are dead, end quote. This same day, Brown took a small sample of white powder from the home, telling Regina, quote, this may be resolved more quickly than you think. I found your cocaine stash and I turned it over to the police, end quote. Testing of the powdered substance would later prove that it was, in fact, baby cereal. When questioned about this later, Brown explained himself saying, quote, I knew it would shut her up and it achieved its purpose, end quote. However, the September 3rd incident continued, with Brown once again bringing up the question of paternity, this time about their youngest who had been born just a year prior. Brown testified that he told Regina he was going to file a paternity suit against Daryl Evans, a professional baseball player who at the time played for the Detroit Tigers. Brown claimed that Evans was their youngest daughter's actual father, and all of this was seemingly based on a letter American Airlines had received from Evans, complimenting the service he and his family had received during a flight on which Regina was present. Asked about this later, Brown offered little explanation saying, quote, I was exasperated with the woman, end quote. Following the hearing, the judge granted Regina's request for a restraining order, and on Monday, September 15th, Brown was barred from the family home. Throughout much of 1986 and early 87, there existed a tense, albeit semi-peaceful, divide between Regina and Brown. But for Newtown, a major crime was about to grab headlines and capture the attention of not just Connecticut, but the entire country. Regina herself would be paying extremely close attention to the case and its developments, not because she had a fascination with crime, not because she had any particular connection to the case, she didn't, but because the story playing out in the newspapers, on the television, and in the courtroom closely mirrored what she most feared would become her own fate. Hella Crafts was a 39-year-old Danish flight attendant working for Pan Am, who was married to Richard Crafts, an Eastern Airlines pilot. The two had married in 1979 and lived together at a house on Newfield Lane in Newtown, less than three miles from Regina. Newtown has always been a popular location for airline employees due to its close proximity to New York's LaGuardia and JFK airports. During the marriage, the Crafts would have three children, and Hella balanced her job with raising the children. But by 1985, the relationship was crumbling. That year, Hella learned that Richard had engaged in several affairs during their marriage, and she began to consider leaving. In September of 86, while Regina was obtaining a restraining order, Hella began meeting with a divorce attorney and eventually hired a private investigator named Oliver Mayo, who, through his investigation, obtained photos of Richard kissing another flight attendant. On the night of Tuesday, November 18th, Hella arrived home after a long and grueling shift working a flight in from Frankfurt, West Germany. Reportedly, she had had enough of Richard's affairs and physical abuse and planned to confront her husband with plans for divorce, though she feared his reaction. Friends would later say Hella was deeply concerned about Richard's temper and was worried he would become physically violent during the confrontation. She even reportedly told friends that if something happened to her, not to believe it was an accident. That night, friends dropped Hella off at her home after work, and she was never seen again. A massive snowstorm hit the area, and at approximately 6 a.m. the next morning, Richard woke his three children and their nanny, driving them to his sister's home, allegedly because the power was out from the storm. Hella wasn't present during the drive, and when Richard was asked, he explained that she'd be joining the family later, though she never did. Richard didn't stay at his sister's house, instead driving back to the new town home. Over the next several weeks, Hella was missing, though Richard always supplied an answer. 
Sometimes he said she was back home visiting family. Other times she was in the Canary Islands. On some occasions, he actually explained that he had no idea where his wife was. Oliver Mayo, the private investigator, became convinced that something terrible had happened to Hella, and in his mind, the only viable suspect was her husband. He began investigating on his own and maintained close contact with police, pushing them to keep looking at Richard, but he met with some resistance. Richard, outside of being a pilot, also worked part-time as a police officer in Southbury and as a volunteer constable in Newtown. At the time, it was the Newtown police who were investigating. It ultimately took an additional two weeks before police officially listed Hella as a missing person, though Richard himself had never filed a report. This caused a lot of suspicion, and soon investigators began digging into the man, his history, and the night his wife was last seen. By December, the state's attorney's office officially removed the Newtown police from the investigation handing it over to the state police. This came as a major insult to Newtown, who felt they were being accused of having mishandled the early stages of the investigation, and for a lot of people, that's exactly what they think was happening. State police first spoke to Don Thomas, the craft's housekeeper. Thomas reported that in the days following Hella's disappearance, when she pressed Richard about her location, he simply told her he didn't know before finally claiming that Hella had gone home to Denmark to visit her sick mother. Thomas also noticed stains in the couple's bedroom, including a large, grapefruit-sized one on the carpet. But days later, that section of carpet had been cut out. Frustrated, investigator Mayo decided to go down to the local dump and search for that section of carpet himself. On December 25th, while Richard and his children were on holiday in Florida, Police served a search warrant on the new town home. During their search, they discovered several pieces of carpet that had been removed from the bedroom, as well as a smear of blood on the side of the bed. During a check of Richard's financials, police found suspicious credit card transactions made just before and after Hella's disappearance. There was the purchase of a new freezer, but it wasn't in the house. He'd also bought new bed sheets and a comforter. Perhaps most curious of all, a $900 charge for the rental of a wood chipper. Mayo later provided police with financial documents given to him by Hella, which showed Richard had also purchased a chainsaw, though this too was missing. The case was eventually broken open with Joseph Hine, a snowplow driver for nearby Southbury and someone who knew Richard personally, when he came forward to tell of an odd account. At approximately 3 a.m. on Wednesday, November 19th, hours after Hella had been dropped off at home, Hine was plowing as the massive snowstorm was settling over the area, and he saw Richard. According to Hine, he spotted Richard driving a U-Haul truck with a wood chipper attached to the back. He was parked next to Lake Zor, approximately 10 miles to the southeast of their Newfield Lane home. Hine says he drove past, and when he came back by two hours later, the truck was there, but the wood chipper was gone. He noted seeing some wood chips on the ground, which he found odd, but he didn't think much of it until he read about the investigation. State police focused on Lake Zor for days, inspecting the land around it and even going into the icy waters. Finding wood chips on the ground, police began intensely looking in that specific area, and over the course of the next several days, they'd make a gruesome discovery. All told, they were able to locate shards of metal, shredded mail addressed to Hella, dozens of bone shards, pieces of human tissue, tooth fragments including a crown, a fingernail covered in pink nail polish, 2,660 strands of bleached blonde hair, and typo blood, the same as Hella. The missing chainsaw would later be recovered from the depths of the lake and was covered in both hair and blood, both of which matched Hella. The crown was also later positively identified matching it to Hella's dental records. Police theorized that Richard had struck Hella in the head with a blunt object in their bedroom, likely killing her. He then placed her body inside of a freezer, the one that he had purchased, for several hours until she became nearly frozen solid. They believe he then cut Hella into smaller pieces with the chainsaw 
before feeding those pieces through the wood chipper, which would have shot the remains into the U-Haul truck. Richard was then believed to have used a shovel to cast the remains into the water, dropping sections onto the shore in the process. Due to the blood, hair, tooth, and tissue evidence, the medical examiner's office issued an official death certificate for Hella on January 13, 1987, and Richard was quickly arrested. In preparation for the trial, the state medical examiner fed a pig carcass through a wood chipper and, through comparison, noted the same marks found on Hella's bones were found on the pigs, confirming the use of a wood chipper. This incredibly disturbing and gruesome case splashed the headlines from coast to coast, and reporters from around the world flocked to Connecticut. The media coverage was so intense that a change of venue would be needed for the trial. Regina was certainly paying attention, as in a drawer in her kitchen, police later discovered countless newspaper clippings detailing the evolution of the investigation. While much of the world was watching with a morbid curiosity and outraged disgust, Regina was paying attention for a much more disturbing reason. A beautiful, sweet, polite flight attendant and mother of three suffers under the tyranny of a violent, abusive, and philandering husband, only to ultimately be murdered and disposed of in a horrifying way. This was not a sensational story for Regina. This was her potentially looking into a mirror. She was reading about Hella and Richard, but in her mind, it could have just as easily have been Regina and Willis. Unfortunately, Regina would mysteriously vanish before that trial even began. Between 1982 and 1987, Willis Brown hired three lawyers and served Regina with divorce papers twice. In his filing, he alleged, among other things, that she had transmitted herpes to him, that none of their three children were biologically his, and that she needed, quote, in-house mental care. Finally, on December 17, 1986, the divorce proceedings began moving forward and Regina knew there was no stopping it. In March of 87, four months after Hella's disappearance and two months after Richard's arrest, Regina finally gave in to the pressure she was feeling about the restraining order keeping Brown away from their children. Ultimately, she would invite him to visit the house to see the kids, breaking that restraining order. When Linda Van Horn later questioned her about this behavior, she told the Times News, quote, I asked her, why would you ever let him near you? Regina honestly thought the children should have a relationship with their father. End quote. During the month of March, Brown made several visits to the home in Newtown. On one occasion, he came by while Regina and the children were out. He would end up leaving several photographs of Detroit Tigers player Daryl Evans, the man he'd accused of fathering his daughter, on the kitchen counter, later claiming that he had done so as a joke. During one visit, Brown apparently approached Regina and asked her to co-sign a home equity loan to help bail out his floundering moped business on Block Island, but Regina refused. According to Brown, the last time he saw Regina was in the latter half of March, when he stopped by to drop off a check and fix one of the cars. Brown later testified, quote, She was up at the top of the driveway talking to one of the neighbors, and Nicholas took the check up to her. When the neighbor left, Regina came down, exasperated, because of the letter I had sent. I, frankly, laughed. End quote. Regina had begun formulating a plan for escape, and in the weeks prior to her disappearance, she'd sent her two oldest children to Texas to stay with her parents. At this point, the only occupants of the Newtown home were Regina, her daughter, and Sharon Ryan, the live-in babysitter. Regina planned to send both her daughter and Ryan to Texas later in the month with her following days after. Brown told investigators that the last time he was in the house was either on Tuesday, March 24th, or Wednesday the 25th, when he'd come looking for tax records his divorce lawyer had requested. Curiously, also on March 25th, Regina placed a mysterious phone call to her close friend, Hope Lambert. According to Lambert, when she answered the phone, Regina immediately interjected, don't talk, just listen. It was clear that Regina was frightened during the call, but she thought things out and was going to move forward with her plan. Lambert would tell the Hartford Courant that Regina explained it all, saying, quote, it's late and it's dark, very dark outside. I've got a long way to go. 
I've got to put Ashley on a plane tomorrow. I'm going to close my account, make a payment on my furniture, and go to see my parents. I've got vacation time coming. I'm not going to tell them why I'm there. I'm just going to go. Willis is really going to try to kill me this time. He means it, Hope. He means it. End quote. Regina then gave Lambert a very specific set of instructions, asking her to promise not just to follow the instructions, but also to stand up for her and speak out should she disappear. According to Lambert, Regina explained, quote, I'm going to leave on the 27th. I'll call you on the 28th. If you don't hear from me on the 28th, wait two days and call my parents. If they haven't heard, wait two more days and call back. If they still haven't heard from me, Willis will have done what he said he would. End quote. Less than 24 hours after making that phone call, on Thursday, March 26th, Regina Brown would be seen alive for the last time. Regina set several tasks into motion in the days before her disappearance. She purchased new furniture and was having repairs done to the house, which at the time was beginning to decline. Tiles in the bathroom were cracked, the porch was rotting, and there were odds and ends which needed attention. Beyond that, Regina also purchased a home security system which was in the process of being installed. Unfortunately, that installation would not be completed before the mother of three vanished. Journalist Lisa Peterson was the crime reporter for the Newtown Bee during the Richard Crafts trial and ultimately went on to be a successful independent journalist publishing articles in major papers and magazines. She's done extensive work on Regina's case in recent years and is currently putting together a book about the case. You can keep up with her work at lisaunleashed.com. She's assembled a tight timeline of events following the last known movements of Regina Brown. According to Peterson, Regina, her daughter, and the babysitter, Sharon Ryan, left the Newtown home at approximately 4 p.m. on Thursday the 26th in Regina's copper or gold-colored Honda Civic. Prior to their trip, Ryan would later report hearing Regina on the phone, and while she didn't know who was on the other end, she specifically heard Regina telling someone to let themselves in to feed the dog. In the months prior, Regina had gotten a dog named Sport for protection, though by this point, he was still less than a year old. Many assume this call may have been to Linda Van Horn's residence, as Regina often paid Van Horn's daughter to watch the dog while she was out of town. The drive from Newtown to LaGuardia Airport on Long Island's North Shore covers just over 70 miles, and depending on traffic can take anywhere from an hour and 15 minutes to two and a half hours. Regina, though, did not go straight to the airport, instead stopping first at the Pathmark Supermarket in Danbury, approximately seven miles from the home along Route 6, also known as Newtown Road. At the store, she bought milk, orange juice, and a container of chili which she ate on the way to the airport. She also cashed a check for $20. Next, the group made a short hop over to McDonald's where Regina purchased a Happy Meal for her daughter. They then took exit 8 off Interstate 84, pulling into a mobile gas station where Regina spent 8 out of the $20 check that she had cashed, filling up the gas tank. From there, they began heading towards LaGuardia. Regina dropped her daughter and Ryan off at the terminal, telling them she'd catch up with them. She drove to the employee lot and parked before heading inside, where she picked up a paycheck and, reportedly, used the payphone several times. Regina kissed her daughter and told her that she loved her, before hugging Ryan and wishing them a safe and easy flight. Their plane was set to take off at 7 p.m. Eight minutes later, at 7.08 p.m., Regina placed a call to her parents' home in Texas, charging the call to her home phone account. She spoke to her mother, apparently to let her know that the flight had boarded and they were on their way. At the time, Ernestine apparently had no idea that her daughter was also planning to come down to Texas in the next days. When last seen, Regina was dressed in a white fleece jacket, white sweater, white pants with a light tan stripe, and tan snakeskin style shoes. Shortly after she hung up with her mother, Regina walked out of LaGuardia Airport and was never seen again, except perhaps by the person responsible for her disappearance. Several hours passed, and neighbors began reporting hearing Regina's dog barking, 
which was out of character. The barking appears to have begun approximately five hours after Regina was last seen around midnight on Friday, March 27th. At 2.04 a.m., Newtown police received a call about the barking dog, but were dismissive. Linda Van Horn explained her call to the police that night regarding the barking. Van Horn said, quote, The police told us they didn't respond to barking dog complaints in the middle of the night. It was a shrilling bark. It was unusual because the dog never barked, end quote. No officers were dispatched to the home that night, and what exactly occurred there has never been fully determined. Former Newtown Police Chief Michael DeJoseph later acknowledged this lack of a response, saying, quote, We should have sent someone to the house on the barking dog complaint. It might have made a huge difference. End quote. Several calls were made regarding the barking dog over the next two days and nights, but again, there was no response from police. Hope Lambert remembered the last haunting call she'd had with Regina and followed the instructions she was given. When Regina didn't call her by Saturday, March 28th, Lambert waited two days as requested. Then, on Tuesday, March 31st, she placed a call to Texas and spoke with Regina's parents. They hadn't heard from her either, but at the time, knowing Regina had asked her to wait an additional two days after this call, Lambert didn't want to needlessly worry her parents. Maybe things had taken longer than she'd thought. Maybe she got caught up in something. There could have been a lot of reasons for the delay. However, the next 48 hours dragged, and with each passing minute, Lambert's sense of concern, dread, and fear was growing. On the morning of Thursday, April 2nd, a full week after Regina had been at LaGuardia Airport, Lambert called Texas again. When she learned Regina wasn't there and her family hadn't heard from her since the 26th, she explained her conversation with Regina, and now fear and panic began to overcome everyone. That panic intensified when the family received a second call, this one from American Airlines, to report that Regina had missed two flight assignments, which was very unsettling as Regina, no matter what was going on in her life at the time, had not missed a shift in five years. Sharon Ryan, down in Texas with Regina's family, picked up the phone and placed a call to neighbor Linda Van Horn. She explained that no one had heard from Regina and no one knew where she was, and she requested on behalf of Regina's parents that Linda take a walk down to the house. Van Horn was already concerned herself as Regina had missed a lunch date with her. Ryan asked if Linda could check for Regina and hopefully find her, but if she wasn't home, they needed some phone numbers from Regina's address book so they could begin calling friends in hopes that someone had seen or spoken with her, or better yet, knew where she was. Linda agreed, and moments after setting down the phone, she planned to make the three-minute walk, but for reasons not entirely understandable to her at the time, she didn't feel safe going alone. Van Horn approached the home of a neighbor and asked if they wouldn't mind coming along, and they agreed. Together, they set off down the street. Regina's home sat at 18 Whippoorwill Hill Road, the last house on the right side of the street, her driveway beginning just before the cul-de-sac fans out into a wide circle. The driveway leads down a slight hill curving to the left where it widens out before the dual doors of a two-car garage with the house set to the right side. Entering the home, they found Regina's dog, Sport, barking and desperate for attention. In the room where the dog was, a bowl of water and a large bag of dog food were there, and the dog food immediately caught Van Horn's eye. The dog food, Kennel Rations brand Tender Chops, had a sticker on it showing that it had been purchased from the Grand Union supermarket. This was strange because, according to Linda, Regina didn't shop at that store. She'd previously had a nasty encounter with an employee who used a racial slur, and so Regina refused to give them her business. Van Horn later told the Courant, quote, I thought going down there that I would find a dead dog. I mean, nobody had been around in a week. There was water in the dish. Somebody had obviously been in the house. End quote. Inside, it appeared to be in good condition, but there were a few details which were out of place. Firstly, Van Horn noted that the drapes hanging above the sliding glass doors in the bedroom were knocked down. In addition to that, the doors weren't locked, 
and Regina was extremely security conscious, even adding a slot to the sliding door's track so that it couldn't be forced open, but there was nothing securing the door. That bothered Van Horn. Regina wouldn't have forgotten to lock the door, especially when she was so concerned about Brown's violent abuse. Linda noticed that Regina's bed wasn't made, which was unlike her, and a washcloth was lying in the bathroom sink, though by this time, it was bone dry. Strangely, beneath the sink, she located Regina's makeup bag, which the 35-year-old never went anywhere without. Her American Airlines ID badge and scarf were in the house, and so was her purse. The car was missing, though. The copper-colored Honda hadn't been seen since the day Regina drove to the airport. After surveying the house, she returned home and called Texas to explain what she'd found. Van Horn then called the Newtown police and officially reported Regina missing. Detective Robert Tvardzik was put on Regina's case, and from the first moments he recalls, the department was concerned that, for the second time in five months, they were investigating the disappearance of a flight attendant and mother of three who was married to a pilot. As Tvardzik told Connecticut Magazine, quote, When the first call came in on this other missing flight attendant, our first response was, oh no, here we go again, end quote. Later that same day, not long after the call from Van Horn, the Newtown police received a second call to report Regina missing. This time, the call was made by her estranged husband, Willis Brown. At the time, Brown agreed to come down to the station and talk with police about the disappearance. According to the Newtown PD, Brown explained that he hadn't seen Regina recently and was no longer living in the home with her and instead had gotten an apartment in Queens. Investigators then asked Brown if he could tell them where he'd been on March 26th, the last day Regina had been seen alive. Brown told investigators that he'd been in Newtown that day for a dentist appointment which had taken place at 2 p.m., two hours before Regina left for the airport. As for the rest of the day, Brown stated, following his appointment, he'd returned home to his apartment sometime that afternoon. When questioned further, he was unable to remember what he had done that night, nor could he remember anything about the following day. When asked if he had any idea where his wife could be, Brown reportedly told police to search for her in, quote, drug-infested areas of New York City, end quote. Brown at the time was neither a suspect nor a person of interest, and so after speaking with investigators, he went home. Investigators proceeded to the Whippoorwill Hill Road home and began a preliminary search for any potential evidence of where Regina might be or what might have happened to her. They arrived on Friday, April 3rd, and entered the home, though they didn't notice much that was out of place and there was no major evidence recovered. Much like Van Horn, they found Regina's purse and an uncashed check for $1,000 inside, her airline ID and scarf, her makeup bag, and the white jacket she had last been seen wearing at the airport, which, for the moment, appeared to confirm that Regina had made it home on the 26th. As Chief DeJoseph later told the Courant, quote, the house was in relatively good order. There were no overt signs of a crime, end quote. I should note at this time, while detectives had gone through the home, They did not bring in the crime lab to do a full sweep. In fact, they wouldn't bring in the state police crime lab for nearly six weeks. And in the time between, they allowed live-in babysitter Sharon Ryan, who had returned from Texas, to move back into the house after she'd been interviewed. Apparently, during her time in the home, Ryan performed several acts which really bothered Linda Van Horn, who told the Courant, quote, The Newtown police made some major mistakes, and you can tell them I said that. I felt that nobody should have been in the house before they had the crime lab people come in, but they kept saying, this is a missing person, not a murder case. They put her back in there. She painted. I mean, she started finishing some of Regina's projects. She wiped up the kitchen, which is where there was a lot of evidence, and I did call the police and object. They said, we have no place else to put her. End quote. Apparently, the massive delay in bringing in the crime lab was based upon legal technicalities. At the time, the Newtown PD were under a microscope due to accusations that they had bungled the Hella Craft case, and so they wanted to ensure everything went by the book following procedure to the letter. 
Did Joseph explain that in order to search the home, they had to obtain permission from Regina's lawyer, Hugh Lavery. They had to file affidavits and go through a lot of legal wrangling to just get to a point where the search could be conducted to ensure that any evidence which might be found could not be dismissed due to a break in procedure. In regard to allowing Sharon Ryan to move back in, to Joseph explain that there was little they felt she could do to damage the investigation, saying, quote, you could paint this wall a hundred times, and if there's blood splatters on there, you're going to get it to come up. End quote. On Wednesday, April 8th, investigators received a call from Sharon Ryan. The babysitter explained that when going through the refrigerator, she'd found the milk that Regina had purchased on the way to the airport. The milk had gone badly sour, and according to Joseph, this made them believe that the milk had likely sat out for a prolonged period of time before being put in the fridge. For some, this suggests that something might have happened to Regina when she arrived home before she could get to the fridge. To Joseph later commented that, even all this time later, the condition of the milk and what it might suggest still bothers him. During their investigation, detectives had canvassed the neighborhood and spoken with several people who lived nearby. While, for the most part, none of them were able to provide any answers, at least a handful of people told investigators they had seen Willis Brown at the home carrying a large bag of dog food around the time Regina disappeared. When questioned about this, Brown admitted that he had purchased the dog food, alleging that he had done so on impulse because he thought a series of commercials the brand ran were funny. He was adamant, though, that he didn't feed the dog. Brown claimed to have brought the food to the house on either March 23rd or 24th, saying that he didn't enter the home again until April 6th after a 2 p.m. dental appointment. Brown's dentist, however, noted that the appointment had actually taken place on April 2nd, the very day Regina was reported missing. While Brown was apparently mistaken about his dental appointment being on Monday, April 6th, that day would become important to police. In the late afternoon of the 6th, the NYPD came upon Regina's missing Honda. The vehicle was discovered parked in front of an apartment building at 242 West 104th Street on Manhattan's Upper West Side. Chief DeJoseph described this area at the time as being a fringe area, sitting between a wealthy area and one he described as drug-infested. Curiously, the same type of location Brown had suggested police look in the beginning. When the car was found, it was unlocked with only the ignition key plugged in. Strangely, Sharon Ryan would later state that when Regina had driven to the airport, her key was attached to a ring with six or seven other keys, but this key was by itself. There were multiple parking tickets tucked under the vehicle's windshield wipers, seeming to indicate that it had been in that spot since around the time Regina vanished. Inside, there were two baby seats in the back, and on the front passenger seat, they found a grocery bag containing several of Regina's belongings. For Chief DeJoseph, this was the piece of evidence that confirmed in his mind that Regina had not left of her own volition, and her disappearance was likely the result of foul play. Newtown Detective Owen Carney, when asked about the car, told the Newtown B, quote, There's a million things you can surmise from that. Someone may have dumped her. Someone may have wanted the car to stick out. Someone may have wanted it to be stolen. End quote. In terms of moving forward, the problem was evidence, which they didn't have much of. And while there was an interest in getting warrants to search Brown's vehicles and property, legally, they didn't have a leg to stand on. As DeJoseph later told reporters, there were no grounds. To this day, there may be no grounds. The vehicle was towed to the state police crime lab in Meriden, though, after a thorough search, no incriminating evidence was recovered. Brown continued speaking to police, answering their questions for a time. Detective Tavarzik later stated, quote, He never lawyered up, but he would only talk to us on his terms. End quote. Soon, rumors began circulating that Regina had run off to escape. Several people told investigators that Brown himself said as much, with neighbor Mary Gaudette Wilson saying that Brown had told her Regina had, quote, just went off with some guy and was living on an island in the Pacific. 
She was an excellent mother, and she was really devoted to those kids. It just didn't make any sense. End quote. No one who knew Regina believed she'd ever abandon her children or her family with whom she was very close. Around this time, the media frenzy was ramping up for the Richard Crafts trial, scheduled to begin the next month in May. During that investigation, Crafts had agreed to take a polygraph test about his wife's disappearance and ultimately passed. This, however, did not stop investigators from charging him with her murder when they found evidence at the lake. As more attention was poured into the Crafts case, sensationalizing it as the woodchipper murder, coverage of Regina's case was falling through the cracks. Police were confronted by a bizarre disappearance, but no hard evidence was available to work with. While friends, neighbors, and family were eagerly pointing a finger at Regina's estranged husband, police didn't have anything to tie him to the crime. Even with the history of abuse, the threats, the statements of friends and family, and Regina's own words in court for the restraining order, they needed something more, something that could link Brown to a crime. Eventually, detectives decided to lay a little more pressure on Brown, asking him if he'd be willing to take a polygraph test. While he initially agreed, he later changed his mind, saying, quote, It didn't do Richard Crafts any good. Next week in Part 2, we'll follow developments in the case over the years. We'll get into how the Crafts trial affected the investigation, a strange and tragic death which led police to follow a crude, hand-drawn map in a massive search for Regina's body on Block Island, disturbing details from divorce testimony, Willis Brown's trip to Texas where he covertly took his children back from their grandparents, a large-scale search employing cadaver dogs in Newtown, the custody battle between the Fontenot's and Willis Brown, the media's poor coverage of the investigation, and questions about the way in which the Newtown police handled the case. In addition, we'll discuss how a disturbing discovery leads to an arrest and conviction in a 23-year-old Newtown case, breathing new life into the search for Regina, how investigators are employing modern technology and techniques not available in 1987 to try and solve this case, as well as all of the theories, or perhaps the theory, circulating around the vanishing of Regina Brown. Originally, I'd intended for this episode to be a single standalone, but there's still so much more to discuss. I want to give a special shout out to the Newtown Bee, Hartford Courant, Connecticut Times News, and Lisa Peterson. Without their amazing work, this episode would not be possible. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine. Anne Bertram. Aurora Kay. Bacon Bits the Cat. Brittany Bivens. Christine Greco. Krista Colvin. Dave Allen. Denise Dingsdale. Diane Dyson. Eric Sumpter. Guillerme Pinto. Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple podcasts or wherever you listen. 
five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. Thank you again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.